Okay, next we have um, a paper titled Para Rajabha, okay, <laughs> collaborative composition um, by a number of very talented authors. So I'm going to read a little about each um, from their bios. So um, Jody, who's over here, um, is currently studying a PhD in ethnomusicology at the University of Sydney. Her research focuses on Aboriginal women, women's music, sorry, in Maningrida, West Arnhem Land, uh, Northern Territory, where she performs with all female band Ripple Effect. Um, also, we've got Rachel Thomas, who's a Jabana. Yep, yeah. yeah, yeah, that one. Um, who is a songwriter and vocalist with the Ripple Effect Band. She's a teacher at Maningrida College and an active manager for ceremonial practice in the Maningrida region. Rona Lawrence is Nakara and um, Burara woman. Uh, she's the bass player and vocalist with the Ripple Effect Band. She composes songs um, in her language. Uh, Alex Turley is an Australian composer and is the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra's 2022 Young Composer in Residence. We've got Lena Jabiba, um, and she is a culture and language consultant and educator who has written children's books and worked at the Luda Language Center at Meningrader College. Uh, Joy Galben, uh, who is an established artist at the Women's Center and Meningrader Arts and Culture. And last, we've got Wendy Doolan, um, and she is manager for the Mi Jung, which is the dreaming. Awesome. Welcome, Jody. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, giving this presentation on Aboriginal land here, uh, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Manangrida, where I do a lot of work and uh, where a lot of these people are right now, um, and particularly the Dukuruji people, uh, who are the traditional owners of the Manangrida township and who are the owners for the Jomi Jang, the Jomi Dreaming, which we will be talking about. Um, I don't know that anybody else from whose name is on this is actually here. We've got lots of film footage. Um, Rachel was hoping to come on board, but um, she is in Catherine for a leadership workshop. Uh, so I'm not sure she's going to make it. I have invited um, Michael Honan from Skinny Fish Music, and I know he's online, and we'll hear a little bit from Michael later and the relevance of um, why he's part of this presentation. Get started. Oh, how do I go from one to one? So I just up there. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the piece Badarajiba, which was um, commissioned um, by the Darwin Symphony Orchestra. So I am a member of the Ripple Effect Band, which some of you already know about. It's an all-women's rock band from the Western Arnhem Land community of Manangrida. Um, we are distinctive um, in the region because women do not um, sing or play music in public. Um, traditional music, women dance, and they can be jungai or managers of song lines, um, and, but they don't um, play the um, didgeridoo or clapsticks or sing in public. Um, there's also not really a strong tradition um, from the past of women in rock bands, though we do have um, Wildflower were um, one of the first bands and they were developed through Skinny Fish Music, so um, with Michael, and they had women in the front line. I guess um, they were around about 10, 15 years ago as women's writing songs and expressing women's side of uh, the women's perspective in music. Uh, but Ripple Effect really are distinctive as women who play instruments um, as well as composing and singing. A um, couple of years ago, uh, Michael introduced us to the Darwin Symphony Orchestra, who then commissioned us to write a piece with Alex Turley. 
And we spent a lot of time talking about what we might write about and how we would approach this. There had been an orchestral piece written and performed in Man and Greta in 2001. Um, with the Darwin Symphony and the Brisbane Symphony Orchestra. So there was a bit of a familiarity with this um, type of music, but um, really when you're in Man and Greta, you don't see orchestral instruments. It's rock instruments or traditional um, instruments. In the end, after talking a long time, we were sitting down on the beach in Darwin and uh, the women started telling me, we, we have a song in our rock band called Cyclone Song, which is about a 2006 cyclone that hit Manic just to the um, west of Man and Greta. And they started talking about this song and um, how the Jomi spirits came. And so the Jomi spirits are um, spirits in Man and Greta, and I'll play you a, um, a little bit of film about that. Uh, but one of the things that struck me was sitting on the beach there, and they were talking about how um, Rona actually, uh, with her family, saw these Jomi spirits in the water swimming out. And I started to get this really amazing picture of this big cyclone coming. Like, it's the biggest cyclone that's ever crossed the coast in Australia. And it headed straight for Manangrida. Um, and this big, you know, black cloud coming and the wind rising. And then this black in the water going out against the tide. And these were the spirits. Um, right at the last minute, the cyclone did actually really weirdly turn and it went west and it headed out um, away and across the coast um, further uh, to the west and nobody was injured. Um, and in Manangrida, they say it was the Jomi spirits, they're tiny you know, children's spirits and they ran out and stood up, swam out and stood up to the storm. So we decided that we would write um, our song about this story. Let's play a bit. Jomi is like women. Very loud, is it? Children. Can you hear it? Sorry, I might just. Sorry, Chris. I hear. You can hear them like kids are crying, just like that. He has two eyes and ears to listen. And the kids, we hear them that they always cry. Same like that, Jomi. And this is where Jomi, Jomi, they live here. When people, they sit here, that three or four houses run there, and they hear people cry. And when the cyclone comes, come and get me. And you're the jungle, you come and like call, you know. Call for them to help to push that cyclone over. Mm -hmm. yeah. So people are they believe what I do because of the knowledge from the old people, my grandfather and my uncle. They told me all about the stories. And, mm. and that's what I do all the time. Wherever cyclone comes, you know, they come and call out. Not here, but right down there. And I call out. And they can hear clearly. And they cry. They cry for help and also they cry for people. Like, we are Jomi. We are Jomi. That's my dad. Probably being a young one, and I'm going to go to the other one. I'm going to go to the other one. Yeah, like, um, like it was dark, and like we can see. But like, when I call here, and they went first to Infant Island and then the cyclone they just pushed and it went back. So they came here and they cried and I was crying. And we couldn't hear any sound, you know, the wind just going from just
So that was um, Rachel, who I just got a message, she's not going to make it, uh, I'm stuck out of Catherine. Uh, and also her mother, Lena, and Lena is a Jungai, so a cultural manager for the Jomi Dreaming. So in Manangrida, you have the traditional owners, the Dukuruji people, and you'll see Joy Galvin later, who's a traditional owner. You also have Jungai managers, and the managers are responsible for making sure that everything to do with that dreaming is enacted correctly and in the right protocol. So the, one of the first things we had to do was we had to go and talk with um, all of the Dukuruji elders and get their permission um, to sing about the Jomi. And Lena took me around um, and we slowly kind of saw everybody. And I just remember um, thinking I was really nervous because nobody has sung about the Jomi before. And here we were a group of women wanting to do this. Um, and to go around, and one of, one of the owners, I stood next to him, da David, and he actually had a tear rolling down his face as he gave permission, because um, to have the Jomi now put into song is a really important thing for people. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this map shows you where Manangrida is. So it's um, right up the top. It's um, right at the top of the NT, Northern Territory. It's part of Western Arnhem Land, though it really sits in Central Arnhem Land. It's influenced by the Eastern and Western um, song traditions. Um, we were composing across distance, so we kind of started this project and then of course COVID happened. Alex got stuck in Melbourne. I was up in Darwin, but we did a lot of composing. So it's really quite a crazy way of composing. And you'll hear Alex talk a little bit about that. Uh, we did a lot of storytelling on the phone. We had to fill Alex into a lot of the, um, the story behind this. We listened to instruments. We looked at YouTube clips of what orchestras look like. Uh, we did story maps um, in order to get the composition happening. And I think Alex will talk here. My name's Alex Turley. I am a composer and I collaborated with Ripple Effect in uh, sort of over a period of six months in 2021 to create Barra Rojaba, um, a story of the Jomi that was performed by the Darwin Symphony Orchestra. Um, this was a pretty cool project for me, actually a, like a really exciting opportunity and something, an experience that I really treasure and hold dear. Um, it's the first time that I have sort of been invited to do a, a collaborative work such as this, of this nature. And so um, it was a learning experience for me um, and also I suppose an opportunity for me to um, try things out with the orchestra and with the band and to sort of work on my own craft. Uh, so this collaboration took place over a period of about six months and for most of those six months we I, I was communicating from Melbourne with um, Jodie Kell who was back and forth between Manangrida and I think a few other places. And so this was really a piece that we put together via text message and also some Zooms, uh, which was a bit of a challenge, but something that we dealt with and ended up working out great. Um, there's a, a long text history in my phone that I have kept um, because uh, sort of over the course of this collaboration, um, uh, audio recordings were being sort of sent to me and I was sending stuff back and so it's really interesting to see how the piece sort of came together from little fragments to a finished product. So the kinds of things that that entails are, I remember right at the start uh, an audio um, message was sent to me that was just sort of a, a detailing of the story of the Jomi and Psycho Monica. Um, which just sort of gave me, I, I suppose, an understanding of the kind of piece that this was going to be. And then later on, there was a little melody that was sung that was um, what the Jomi sounds like to, um, I think, to Joy Galvin. And that was interesting because I took that melody and I immediately put it into a MIDI oboe and sent it back. I was like, is this what you, you know, would this be something that we could do? And I, I got back a yes. This sounds great and so in the piece that we eventually created there's a recurring oboe melody that represents the Jomi spirit and 
uh, kind of came together in that way, which was really cool. Um, also, there was a I'm just going to stop that there because I'm going to play you um, the melody that Alex was talking about. Um, it's really important because Lena, who you saw before, um, she actually communicates with the Jomi, being a Jungai, and she spoke about her uncle and her father. She can um, go down to the waterhole where she was sitting, and so she's heard the Jomi sing. And this is what we sent him via touch. <laughs> This is what he sent back. And that picture I chose because um, the Jomi spirits are very emotional for anybody who's been to Manangrida. Lena said it before, the Jomi is us. We are the Jomi. And people will say that when you've lived in Manangrida or spent time there, the Jomi are inside you. And wherever you go, they are with you. And so when you hear these songs, like even then I was feeling like I was going to tear up. Um, Lynch. I'll just get through that. Um, and so um, I'm just going to show you that we can't go to the waterhole and film that, but we were able to do this filming on the beach and also film um, the start of the piece has a calling out and we filmed some of this down there to put together over um, Alex's and our composition. I'm now just going to um, talk a little bit about um, the power of what happened with us being commissioned this piece. And our first performance of it was at Barunga Festival in 2021, actually, I think. It says 2020. Maybe it was 2020. 
Uh, 21, Michael can probably correct me. Um, so what happened at Barunga is a festival held, it's just outside of Catherine. It's been running for a long time. It's Barunga is an indigenous community and they've been holding a music, sport and culture festival there for I don't know, however many years. I think Michael, you're online, you could probably um, I don't know how to show that so we can see Michael. Um, and when we performed there with this song, they actually got a bigger stage. So it's really essentially a rock music festival and traditional bungle festival, and it has sports. Um, and so when we performed there, they brought the symphony, Darwin Symphony Orchestra there. And this is a list of these amazing um, pieces that were performed that night that we were part of. Um, we had the Jari Project, which is um, Guwambal Gurawiwi from the Galpul clan, who's worked with an MT musician, Netanella Mizra, and they have created um, a lot of his uh, Galpul clan songs put for um, a small um, ensemble and choir. And two minutes. Um, Manuel Durukai singing um, Lunguru Mara Naumul, uh, really inspiring for us to see him um, sing. Yuani, which is from Numbuwa um, with Don and Lachlan. And then of course, maybe a big inspiration for us all is Jaramidi, Child of the Rainbow. That was um, Gurumul's, Dr. Gurumul's last album that came out after he passed away, produced by Michael. And I think one of the amazing things um, about that album is it actually came out in 2018, number one on the Australian music charts. It's the first um, album in language, at Aboriginal language, to be the number one um, in the music charts. And it was amazing because it was also a classical music. It wasn't rock music. And so it was kind of an outstanding achievement. And they played excerpts of that with um, various people um, doing voiceovers um, to fill in. And then we sang Bara Rajiba. Um, it was an amazing night and the audience reaction was incredible to be at this festival and suddenly see this whole new realm of music and the power of having these collaborations between indigenous and non-indigenous composers, between rock musicians and classical musicians was very exciting and inspiring. And in the case of Badarajiba, it means that now we have um, a series of songs. We have a rock song, we have this orchestral piece, and since then we also were commissioned by the um, Department of Education for that song to be rearranged for our 400 children choir that was performed at the Opera House earlier this year. So now um, the Dukuruji people of Manangrida um, have their Jomi, Jomi spirits sung in song by women. And um, these new forms of music are allowing this um, kind of expression of connection to spirits in a new way. Thank you, Jody. It's so exciting to hear about all the amazing things happening. Um, were there any questions straight off the mark? Okay, well, I'll start. Um, <laughs> That's good. You said um, you had to kind of get permission to talk about the journey. Yeah. That's how we say it. Um, could you talk a little more about why it was so significant um, to have them represented in song? You said the man was quite emotional. Oh, he was. Um, like I said, like Jomi, um, for everybody. Oh, there's Michael. Hi, Michael. Um, <laughs> um, the Jomi are like it is. They're they're a child spirit, as Rachel explained earlier. Um, and they the spring is there in Manangrida Township, and connected to that, um, uh, lots of stories like. Like a lot of things I find with the music in Manangrida, there's these layers. So you might listen to that piece and you go, that's a beautiful evocative piece that kind of capturing this feeling. Um, but for me, um, for people who have lived in Manangrida, we know the spring, we know about the Jomi spirits. We know people who have passed on and passed away um, that we were close to. And you connect with that, that emotionality. And the other big thing is this idea that the Jomi are us and they're inside us. 
And it was amazing when we performed in Darwin, um, there was a couple there and their baby had been born. They, they, they were in Manangrita when um, Ingrid got pregnant and they'd left and they came to see the performance. And as soon as Lena called out with this orchestra piece, this baby that had been sitting quietly the whole through all these other performances, she called out and the baby just called back again, wah, like this. <laughs> so, you know, like that idea that you actually are connected. Um, and I think when, the, when we approach the traditional owners um, in Manangrida, you know, there's lots of politics going on all the time about the ownership of land. It's like everywhere. Yeah. And these Jomi are really important for people. So they were, I think, really excited that um, Ripple Effect Band wanted to sing yeah. about Jomi. Yeah. And they felt honoured. And also now the Jomi are in song. Mm. And for them, that means the Jomi will continue to be sung yeah. about and thought about. It's a form future. of cultural continuation. Yeah. 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 Um, great. Anyway. I just I thought I might ask Michael. Will we, can we hear Michael on Zoom if I ask him something? Okay, Michael, can you unmute yourself? He said he didn't oh, want no. to speak. Look, he's going. <laughs> I think he's saying he can't unmute himself. Ah, oh, maybe he can't. How's that? Oh, there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Michael, I just, I thought I would ask you, um, so you can just express, I know, question for you, but you know, what was the inspiration behind that night at Barunga? Because as you and I well know, and anyone that's been to Barunga, it is famously to be bungal and rock music. Um, and then suddenly there was an orchestra there. Can you talk a bit about the inspiration be behind um, programming that night? Um, thanks, Jody. We're just... We were running Barunga Festival and we'd seen the orchestra go out to a lot of different locations and perform European orchestral music. And I thought if we did have the orchestra come to Barunga Festival, the most fitting way that it could be effective there was to actually be an accompanying body to uh, Arnhem Land and First Nations performers to front it. So if you like, the orchestra was backing band, a, a lush full backing band for um, First Nations performers. And that was kind of the inspiration. So it got, there's a strong following. The Darwin Symphony Orchestra has a strong following. So a lot of its um, supporters came to the festival, but saw the orchestra work in a really different way, which was like an accompanying body for those different artists. The Nubuar artists, the Manangreta artists, the uh, Arnhem Land, Galawinku artists. Yeah. It, was, it was an amazing night. And I know um, talking to audience, both um, Indigenous community people who come into Barunga, as well as um, visitors, um, Everybody loved it. I think it was a really special evening that night. But that's my question to you. Anyone else got any questions? Thank you so much, Jodie and everyone. Um, this is a question about gender, related to gender. Um, and I'm just really curious on if you can say more about the evolving role of Uh, it is a really interesting question. As I said before, you know, um, Wildflower really were a front runner, then Ripple Effect came along. And being on instruments, like we have a female um, Nakara woman who plays drums. And a um, long time ago, the first time a girl got on stage to play drums in Manangrida, some of the um, old men got up, it wasn't necessarily old men, some of the men got up and said, women can't play drums. And it was men musicians that stood up against them and said, um, people like Horace Walla Walla from Sunrise said, no, 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 that's not a thing, women can. And so by support, with this support from male musicians, from elders, um, Ripple Effect Band had the authority to perform. And I think by working in these different genres, um, you know, we're, we've got an EP, we're working on an album that's essentially a rock album, but by these kind of opportunities um, to work in different mediums of music 
It is broadening how people in Manangreen communities see us as musicians. And um, one of our songs that we've got now, actually a couple of our songs, but one in particular that we have on our album coming up, has a very Gunwalk style part in it. Um, and be because it's in this, um, in, in the place of rock music, it's accepted. We've sung that in community. We've actually stood on stage with Tara singing, you know, the Namango, Namango, Gangle, Mare, you know, with us clapping. It sounds Gunbok. But nobody says you can't do that because we're in this safe place and because a lot of people want to see more creativity that's supportive of the women. Um, I think we're also, it's really interesting because as you and I know, so many realms, um, composition uh, has been dominated by men, rock music scene has been dominated by men. So there's these kind of all these vectors crossing where we are breaking ground as a group of women. Um, I am continually amazed and honoured to work with the women in the band who have continued to say, we want to compose. We'll stand up against anything that goes against us. We want to stay on instruments. And I think that says a lot about their um, brave, braveness and um, courage. Uh, and I think things are changing. I do think there's more and more younger women musicians coming through the scene. Michael, would you agree that it's slowly changing up there? Um, and the first time we played at Barunga, I think we were almost the only women, maybe Shelley Morris was there, but I do remember Michael had said, come backstage, and we got to the backstage, and it was like there was this invisible force field around it, because we kind of got to think, we looked in, and there's all these men, and they were painting up, and there was this and that going on, and it was like, boing, and everyone ran back. And we had to really kind of go, we're gonna do this, you know, we are gonna do this, and get really strong and go in. But now at Baranga, you know, you go backstage and there's women wandering in and out. There's, there's definitely a big um, change happening in, um, in the scenes that we work in, but a long way to go. Yeah. Questions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much, Jodie, and all the collaborators on that. It's really terrific. Um, I was wondering when you're talking about obviously this women playing instruments thing is already new and pushing some boundaries and did the experience of working with the orchestra and having Alex send back these different orchestration possibilities have any impact on how the band, Ripple Effect Band is now thinking about instruments? Has it impacted? I think one of the things it's done, it's really raised the confidence of the women. And then, and then the secondary thing of performing at the Opera House, or not performing, but going to the Opera House and having a group perform that song. Um, this kind of confidence where it's moved from, okay, we're a rock band and we're in there. And we're also like doing this orchestral work and, you know, they were so proud. It was really difficult at Barunga to get on stage. We were all totally terrified. And we watched Manuel, I was saying to Michael, watching Manuel do a before us on the screen backstage. It's like, oh, that's what, we're gonna be like rabbits in the headlights, was <laughs> a phrase I kind of translated for people, but for the women there. But we got up and did it, and then we did it on stage, you know, as part of the festival. And so I think it has, one, it's increased their confidence tremendously. And the people who are the traditional owners of Man and Greta really want us to do this, that also really increased the confidence for the women, where it was like, the, David, who was crying, you know, they, they were scared. They were like, when we got there, they, you go in. We're not going, we're too scared. <laughs> you go and ask him, you know. They, they were so nervous about this. And to have him stand there and actually say, what, you're gonna sing about the, you're gonna sing about the Jomi. You're gonna write this song and this tear rolling down his face made, um, I, th I think it really kind of confirmed that we're on a really good path. Um, the album that we've got going has definitely been influenced, even though we don't have a lot of orchestral instrumentation in there. I think it's kind of opened up our ability to experiment with different feels, different sounds, different rhythms. Um, so yeah, in terms of our arrangements and stuff, it's been a big, a really great experience. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jodie. Such a, and Michael.